Hi guys, so um, here's our second go at the Battle of Kernstown. Um, I've been having another look at the Pickett's Charge rules and uh, there is a, a recommendation in there for very small units uh, under 200 strong um, that you uh, deploy them as only two bases and deploy them in skirmish formation using the sharpshooters um, because of the uh, weakness of the units. That will go quite a long way to reduce their firepower. So we're going to go have a go with that variant, see if that changes the outcome. Uh, the Union troops also have deployed more to the flank for this rerun of this game. I'm not going to show all the dice rolls for it this time, because uh, I'm sure you guys might all find that uh, a bit tedious to see exactly the same game uh, played out. But I will come back at the end of each turn and just give you a quick uh, recap on how this refight of Kernstown goes, see whether the Union troops can be any more effective. And, uh, and see how this rule modification works and give you some reflections at the end. All right, cheers, guy. hope you, cheers guys, hope you enjoy uh, this brief recap of my refight. Cheers, everyone. Okay, at the end of the first turn, the uh, Union troops did pretty well. They put a, um, a double time order uh, on this brigade and have moved forward uh, pretty effectively. Their opening battalion uh, regiment, rather, has opened fire at the defending uh, rebels behind the wall. As you can see, the rebels also took this turn to move up to the wall. Um, uh, we've got a couple of regular regiments there and a couple of regiments of skirmishers up against the wall. Anyway, the Union firing had no effect. The cover of the wall protected them and the return fire from the rebels did cause two casualties on the attacking Union troops. But the Unionists are uh, looking to deploy with a broader front line, so we'll see how that works in this game. The Rebs have returned fire, their light cavalry over on the far flank has caused a couple of casualties against the Union regiment that was moving up there. Union artillery has caused one casualty on this regiment behind the wall and one casual two casualties on the regiment in the open. And we've got to fire this battery at effective range against uh, those Union troops out in the open. We are firing overhead. So uh, let's see what the adjustments are. No casualties, battery didn't move. Uh, it's not 12 pounders, it's not routed, the target is not in cover. Um, that is it, I think. All right, so let's see. We get a nine, that's pretty good at effective range. That is two more casualties on this Union regiment and a C the elephant test. Let's hope the Union assault does not start stuttering so early in the game. Uh, <laughs> Reroll a four. That goes down to a three. That will be um, a bit of a sad result for the Unions. I, um, on, a, on a regular note, actually, they're only whip. They're not a rat. So that's not a fault to test on this Union Brigade. But that front Union Regiment will have to fall back. All right, that's it for the turn. On to turn two. Right, here we are at the end of turn two. The Union troops continue to deploy off the hill. Uh, again, attacking with a broader frontage than in the last game. A couple of their regiments, or in fact three of their regiments, are unformed and fall out this turn. They are um, just about at the margins of uh, extreme musketry range for the Confederates. So um, rather than uh, allowing the Unionists to take advantage of a half an inch difference in range, which means they're in and the Confederates are out, I'm, uh, I'm deeming that the Confederates can take a shot at extreme range. And actually there are some extreme range rules, I think. Um, so I need to check actually how extreme range works. Um, but I, uh, I just applied an extra minus one for the first turn for the um, Confederate fire, but uh, actually none of it had effect. Confederate artillery did better, this battery here caused a couple of casualties on the large Union regiment down there and their cavalry continued to whittle down the opposing regiments. Unfortunately for the rebels, uh, we got uh, an exhaustion result uh, uh, on this battery and as they were under artillery assault, they took two casualties rather than simply one from a fatigue, uh, an artillery team fatigue roll. Right, that's the end of turn two. Let's see how turn three plays out. Right, just checked the extreme range rules. It's an optional rule, you can use it. Only veteran units that haven't moved can use it. Uh, and they uh, take a minus one, so that was a, a good guess by me. I guess I'm getting to know the rules quite well. Now it does say you can only use it on rifled muskets and it takes them from 18 to 24 inches. I think, again, given that we're just half an inch out, I will allow uh, the smooth more muskets to reach the ed edge of that woodland that uh, the Union troops are forming up uh, in. So if the Union troops choose to form up outside the woodland, uh, I will allow these uh, um, 
Confederates to fire at them. All right, uh, we'll get on and roll for initiative and do turn. Okay, so here we are at the end of turn three, so the Union troops are almost completely out of the woods now. They'll be able to form up next turn as that all their regiments are under the trees. They're exchanging musketry with the Confederates behind this wall, neither side causing too many casualties, but the addition of Union artillery against these positions is helping this time. Uh, the Confederates uh, uh, moved second, so the Union troops, which carefully positioned themselves to deliver large volleys against the Confederate cavalry, uh, were thwarted as the Confederate cavalry just pulled back in their movement turn, took them out of range, uh, and they're accomplishing their mission of significantly slowing this Union attack as they move up, form to fire on the cavalry, and then uh, as the Confederates continue to lose initiative, they get to move second and pull back. So uh, tactics working there for the Confederates. Uh, Union fire a little bit more effective in this game on this flank. All right, let's see how turn four plays through. All right, <laughs> if you come back and look at this shot, you won't see much difference. So both uh, Union brigades went hesitant this turn. Um, they only had one ADC and they failed the uh, reroll on that one. Uh, and for the Confederates, they also only had one ADC. Although they got all their regiments active, uh, nothing moved on their side. So the Union uh, troops stood where they were, the Confederates volleyed against them, and both sides caused almost no casualties. All right, back with the turn five. All right, so quite a lot of uh, movement, certainly on the right flank. So the Union here on the left formed up, opened fire. We've got three and five casualties on the two main Confederate regiments defending the wall, so they're starting to suffer. In the centre here, this Union position is proving reasonably strong, this Union it's taken six casualties, but the guns and the skirmishes have caused quite a few casualties on the Union regiment that closed up on the fence line. The large Union regiment and the other small uh, and uh, skirmish regiments over on the far left uh, moved up to the fence line. I expect the cavalry to pull back this turn, otherwise they will suffer seriously from the uh, Union firing. All right, on with the next turn. All right, at the end of turn eight, I think it is, uh, we're starting to see casualties build up and the situation starting to become more fluid. So over here, the Union attack is really gaining momentum. You've got the four regiments really uh, close up against the wall. You've got uh, nine casualties on that uh, rebel unit uh, hugging the wall and only skirmishes in support and the other Union sorry, uh, Confederate regiment uh, failed uh, see the elephant test following a volley uh, by this regiment. And then for the rebels, uh, some uh, success on the center as their artillery battery has broken and routed uh, that Union regiment, which was up against the fence line. So there will be a falter test against the left hand um, Union brigade that uh, has moved up to the fence line. All right, we'll see what happens in turn nine. Right, turn eight, pretty dramatic. The Union have broken through, so uh, this infantry unit charged the wall and uh, drove uh, back the uh, skirmishers that were opposing it and has swept forward. Uh, it in turn got hit by gunfire from this Confederate battery and this further Confederate battery that was holding the road has swung around and hit it as well. So it's taken four casualties this turn and then gone unformed. The rest of the Union troops have moved up to the wall and their assault on the wall has destroyed the Confederate um, uh, small battalion uh, regiment that was holding the wall in the, in this position here. So there will be a falter test on uh, this uh, regular Confederate brigade. The Union troops on the on their left, on the Confederate right, are reeling back. Uh, they broke after their unit uh, on the road was destroyed by the artillery fire from this gun uh, gun battery in the previous turn. Uh, they've got a chance to uh, rally next turn, uh, but that has taken some pressure off the Confederates on the right flank. So there are falter tests again on that Union Brigade on the left, and there will be a falter test on this Confederate Brigade uh, as well. All right, let's do turn. All right, so here we are on the turn 10. Um, it's looking great for the Union. They are, uh, they've caused uh, another regiment of... Uh, Rebels to break the unit that was down here in the centre succumbed finally to the weight of long-range Union artillery fire. They're now turning their attention to this regiment. Uh, so those uh, that long-range fire is really uh, having its effect. And the Union troops are now moving back uh, under their obey orders, haven't yet put any pressure on this flank. But we've only got two units of skirmishers and one rebel regiment left on this flank. Ashby's cavalry is looking to deploy across to the left to try and push back this Union assault. 
Now, uh, although it looks pretty dire here, we've got four units of skirmishers and one regular unit left, we do still have two fully effective um, rebel artillery batteries here. So this Union attack may be on the point of collapse. So we are going to play this another couple of turns and see what plays through. This front unit here has taken five casualties. This one next to it, eight. This one here, six. And this one here, six. Um, and simply that small unit, which is green uh, hasn't taken any yet so the um the weight of skirmish and artillery fire may be enough alternatively uh, the union may just be able to push its way through and drive these rebel uh, units off the table let's see what happens as we play turn all right so it's pretty dramatic on the left all the union troops have charged the skirmishers down here had to fall back uh, in front of those charges we will have contact against this confederate regiment down here and we've got a flank charge going in against the guns the rest of the Union line has moved up. Let's do these charge results. Right, on turn 11, we're gonna call that a game. And this one uh, has been a uh, much closer fought game. Um, really very close right up to the end. I'm quite, I find it quite hard how to call it. So Jackson's orders were to cause chaos uh, and disrupt um, the Union forces. Well, he hasn't broken their assaults, and they actually did win on their first assault, so he didn't throw anything. No, that's not quite true. He did throw the, uh, the Unionist Union troops on the Confederate right flank back. Uh, but the Union troops on the left uh, have broken through the, um, uh, the wall line that the, Union, uh, that the Confederate troops uh, formed. Certainly breaking the Confederates down to skirmish units for the very small uh, Virginia regiments really made a difference, significantly reduced their firepower and they couldn't stand up to the Union troops when they charged. The Union also deployed their troops to bring more of that firepower into effect. So they did actually achieve firepower superiority despite the rebels being behind the wall because they were using three regiments against two formed regiments and they also applied much of their long-range artillery to the units behind the wall. I also downgraded the wall from a minus two protected factor to only a minus one. That all helped the Unionists uh, tip the balance on this flank. On the right flank, uh, the Confederates did pretty creditably. They only lost one regiment on this flank. This other one down here is uh, badly walled. It's taken, um, well, eight casualties, but the uh, three small regiments, in fact, all the skirmishers are pretty much untouched and are just falling back in front of the uh, Union forces and the two Confederate gun batteries uh, will as a priority limber up and pull back otherwise they will be overwhelmed they probably should have pulled back last turn but uh, the state of the Union attacking forces uh, is pretty sorry and if they weren't fighting skirmishers uh, they probably wouldn't be able to press on any further so let's have a look at the gory details this front regiment uh, here has taken eight casualties the second regiment here has taken six casualties this regiment here has taken 11 casualties so only one away from a break test this regiment here has taken six casualties so this brigade uh four it's four line regiments have all taken at least 50 percent casualties and two are pretty much ineffective now for the brigade on the right one unit was driven off the table this one has taken six casualties the other one has taken five casualties so both union brigades have taken um, over 50% casualties uh, or have fled the table. So a lot of casualties are caused by the rebel forces. Um, and they only had, what, three, three, four small regiments on the table that were doing the majority of the fighting. So uh, I sort of had in my head a 12 turn game uh, and after 12 turns, Jackson would withdraw. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, what happened in Kernstown was the rebels were pushed back from wall like we've seen here and fell back um, from uh, the battlefield. They certainly lost the battle on the day, but uh, Jackson achieved a strategic victory as the strength of his presence here, and indeed his aggressiveness, which we didn't see from these rebels, uh, but the aggressiveness he showed convinced the Union generals they were facing a larger force and they would re redeployed reserves from the Washington area into the valley. All right, I uh, hope you enjoyed the second playing of this game. Uh, I think a little bit more historic and perhaps I'll use it, uh, and use these very small regiments as skirmishers in my games going forward, see how that plays through. All right, cheers everyone. Hope you enjoy this and see you next time.